Hello there. Hello. It's so good to see you. Welcome, welcome everyone. Uh, I, I, I'm very excited right now to have this conversation to introduce uh, Elizabeth Filippoli, uh, a woman whose work and voice I so deeply admire and respect. Uh, Elizabeth, as you know, is, um, is a journalist, is an investigative journalist who has worked in the past with various international, prominent international media outlets. She is at the same time an activist for women's rights, a social entrepreneur. She's the brain, the CEO behind the Global Founders um, uh, Forum, Global Thinkers Forum, sorry, which has been active and um, doing amazing work in 65 countries now. Uh, but most importantly, I think for me personally, she's my Greek sister. She's my global sister. Uh, and she's someone I'm so happy to have met, you know. So I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Welcome, Elizabeth. Thank you. Thank you, Elif. It is always a delight to see you, to hear from you whenever we uh, have an event together. It really is my, my favorite day, and I mean it with all my heart. So you do not need any introductions, really. Uh, you are an award-winning British-Turkish novelist. You, you write in both Turkish and English. You have published 18 books, 11 of which are novels. Your work has been translated in 54 languages, am I right? <laughs> and I'm very excited to say that your new book is coming up in early August, The Island of Missing Trees. And, and so what can I say? I mean, uh, you are changing this world with your thinking, with your, your ideas, your activism. You're someone um, who's a role model in every sense. And I mean, there's no, you know, no element of flattery, Elif. And I'm very honored uh, to have this conversation with you today to launch my book, From Women to the World, together. You're also a contributor to this uh, anthology of letters. Um, and uh, I'm all yours when it comes to the questions. As a journalist, I always, I'm, I'm always the one who raises questions. Now it's your turn. That's wonderful. I, you know, I cannot recommend this book uh, more wholeheartedly. I think it's, it is so inspiring, Elizabeth. I really don't know where to start. Also, because today, uh, as you might have followed in the news, Turkey is officially withdrawing from the Istanbul Convention. This is an international treaty that is designed to protect women and children and minorities, you know, anyone who's suffering from violence, to protect them, but also to prosecute the perpetrators of violence uh, at a time when we need the convention the most, because signing it is not enough. It has to be implemented, put into practice. Uh, the fact that the government is officially withdrawing from it is, is just breaks my heart. So at a moment like this, you know, I don't want to act with anger. I don't want to speak with anger. Uh, we need hope. We need inspiration. Where do we find inspiration in such a troubled world? But well, this is where we find inspiration, you know, in your work, in your voice. So <laughs> shall we start with your, with your brilliant book? How did it happen? You know, why the need? Why this book and why now? Yes, absolutely. But I would like us at some point in this conversation to go a little bit more into, you know, what you just mentioned, what you just raised, because it is a major issue that, that Turkey is withdrawing from the Istanbul Convention. But we will get there. Um, let, let us open, yes, are you, as you are suggesting, this conversation. Um, with, first of all, a thank you to Waterstones for hosting us and my publisher, I. B. Torres, for being such incredible supporters of women's voices in a world, a leaf that is very troubled and in need of um, what you propose in your books and what I am proposing, you know, in my book, more humanness, more emotional intelligence and less testosterone, really. So how I came up with the concept, women writing letters to other women, you know, I would say it is one of those ideas um, that may pop up in your head in the middle of the night. They're like a little light in the dark, like a weak flickering light, which you don't know if it will just disappear or if it will get stronger and stronger and eventually light up the darkness. Um, the idea of inviting leading women to write a letter to another woman was born some three years ago 
when I came across a letter that my mother had written to me when I was 11. She didn't give it to me before I turned 18. I read it then and I kept it safely in a drawer. Life went on and I discovered it again three years ago. And so in these four pages, she was addressing an, her 11 year old daughter, opening her heart about her life, her emotions, her dreams, hopes, and also making it like a confession about her own challenges and pains and, and struggles and, and shortcomings as a mother. So my mom was 30 at the time, and unfortunately more challenges were to come her way and our way later on in life. But this is life, right? I mean, life is hard. There's nothing else, you know, to add there. So it was a piece of writing that had a profound message to communicate at least. She was asking me to listen to her as a mother, a daughter, a sister, as another woman who survives and thrives through a great deal of struggles. When I rediscovered this letter three years ago, I was not the 18 year old girl anymore. I was in my 40s, a mature woman who had been called to survive her own pains and struggles and right or wrong decisions in life. And I was then able to read my mom's words and interpret her thoughts through a different lens. I was less opinionated than the 18 year old girl and much more generous in my understanding and compassion. And through, through, so through this letter, in a way, I rediscovered my mother, her need to speak to someone she loved, someone she trusted, the need of a woman to speak her heart profoundly and candidly, without the fear of being judged, without having any reservations, without think, thinking that she could be stigmatized. So in a way, it was a catharsis for her, which I would never have been able to realize when I was 18. And it became a catharsis for me when I revisited it. So at that moment, I realized that very often we take for granted the emotions of our loved ones. We think we know them well enough, but maybe we do and maybe we don't. So what if we paused and paid more attention to each other's stories? How would that shape our thinking? And so Elif, for the last 20 years, I have been taking part in panels and conferences. I've had the incredible opportunity to work with women like yourself, but I wanted to bring to the world some new narratives from you and Muna and June and Geraldine and Grazia and Paola and all of us 34 women from 19 countries. And this is, you know, how this, this flickering light, that weak light in, in the darkness became what I see as a global conversation through this book. And we have become each other's daughters and sisters. This is what women from women to the world is about. So. You have addressed Jacinda Dern. How, how did you come up with the idea of addressing Jacinda? Yes, you know, I am very honored to, to have a little piece in this uh, important book. Um, but before we maybe we continue, I should also tell our audience that we would love to have their questions, their comments at the end of this talk. So please, you know, if anything comes to your mind, prepare it uh, and, and please share it with us. I loved writing this small letter um, and it was of course the timing of it. This was right after a horrific you know, terrorist attack in New Zealand that really uh, traumatized an entire country and left an impact on so many people across the world. But before that, maybe I should mention, you know, again, where I come from, I look at Turkey, even though it's a very patriarchal society, clearly very homophobic, very sexist society, it doesn't mean that women in Turkey, for instance, are weak or, or you know, passive. They're incredibly vocal and, and visible in so many areas, but there's one area in which women are almost non-existent, and that is politics. Mm -hmm. So when I look at local, regional, and national level politics, especially as you move the ladder up, on the upper echelons of, of the political mechanism, when I look at decision makers, they're all conservative, you know, middle-aged or old-aged, religious, macho men. 
and that changes everything. So I honestly need, think we need more women in politics, in decision-making processes, women of all backgrounds. We need to diversify our public space. And to me, it was important to, to focus on what Jacinda Ardern is doing. I think, unlike many politicians, the fact that she can show her emotions and she doesn't see emotions as a source of weakness, that was important to me without going into mm -hmm. jingoism, nationalism, you know, tribalism, to try to create another language. That is something that I find very important. But if I may follow up on that, Elizabeth, how do you see the human nature? You know, it's, I know it's a very philosophical and very broad subject, but do you think we're making progress? Uh, and, and very briefly, maybe I can add this, I've heard people saying, until recently that you need feminism over there, but not so much in the Western world, uh, which I think is not the case, you know, but, but how do you approach, you know, first of all, humans existence, but also our need for feminism? Well, Elif, we live in a very troubled world, uh, but let me tell you, this world reflects who we are as humans. And as humans, we have this dual nature we have been created to be good and to be evil. We're thirsty for power and we can become greedy and reckless and violent and cruel and indifferent. But then we can also bring caring and compassion and tolerance and understanding and love. So the battle has always been between the good and the evil, but ultimately it is a matter of choice. We can choose who we want to be. We can choose how we want to live our lives, whether to live a life of individualism or to live a life of service to others in whatever way we can serve others. The problem I think with this world is that it has always been about the domination of the physically stronger. And this is what the system of patriarchy is constructed upon. The word patriarchy, Elif, as you probably know, has a Greek root. It's, it's from patir, pateras, which means father. Yeah. So the strong male figure in the house, the one who's in control, who calls the shots. Mm -hmm. He could be the protector or he could be the abuser. He could be the guardian or the traitor. So I was reading an article recently about something as simple as the rolling suitcase. I think it is very telling about that perpetuation of the macho culture over the centuries. So although the wheel had been invented for thousands of years, as we know, and traveling as a trend exploded in the 19th century, it was not until the early 1970s that this resistance against the rolling suitcase was, was removed, was abandoned. The reality is it had only to do with gender. Uh, the, the inventor of that suitcase, I think it was a guy named Bernard Sado, if I'm not mistaken, I might be uh, pronouncing his name wrong, but he had said that he had great difficulty to get the U.S. department stores to market it because the reason was the prevailing macho culture. Men used to carry the luggage for their wives. It was a natural thing to do and smashing that or attempting to smash this, it would mean going against a norm and, and a threat, it would be a threat to the male status as the stronger sex. But if this gesture might sound chivalrous to some, it has another very dangerous aspect. That aspect and that element of control. I am stronger than you are. I lift your suitcase, I take off your burdens for you, therefore you need me, therefore I am in control. And this, I think, can be a metaphor to project the dangerous power game that is going on and has a counterproductive trickle-down effect on our societies. It permeates all aspects of the system we live, a system in which we have lived for, for thousands of years, hierarchical and top-down, and we need to do things together. And this is what I would like to hope that we are achieving together over the years with these sustained efforts, joining forces, joining voices, to eventually, steadily, gradually break down this system. Absolutely. I, I, I want to follow up on what you said. Um, you know, the, the, the kind of feminism that I 
you know, long for is, is the one that doesn't go within or retreat into a tribe, but opens up, you know, goes hand in hand with LGBTQ plus rights, but is also very much aware of all kinds of layers of discrimination, whether it's racial inequality, digital inequality, you know, uh, e ethnic or, or regional inequalities. So opening up the conversations, but also inviting men on board. Sometimes people think this is a zero sum game and if women gain their rights, it's gonna take something away from men, not at all. Living in a patriarchal society has shown me that of course under inequality, women are unhappy, but men are unhappy as well. And one of the things that always impresses me about your work and your voice is this broad vision that you have. You start uh, from women to the world with a dedication to your grandmother and to your mother, but also to your father, whom I know has played an important role in your life. So shall we talk about masculinity a little bit more? You know, yes, there is a toxic form of masculinity, but there's another form of masculinity which doesn't get encouraged enough, shared enough. And also, I think under patriarchal regimes, there is, you know, so much expectation from men to conform to one type of masculinity. And if they don't do that, they're also shunned or rejected, sometimes even ridiculed, you know, and we have to confront that as well. So I'd love to hear your opinion, but I'd love you to tell us a little bit about your father too. Thank you for, for bringing up my father. Um, my dad was a journalist and author and poet, and, and he was someone who was, you know, looking at the world and thinking about the world in the broader sense. So, so he was a visionary and, and from, you know, a very early age, I mean, I, I will never forget, you know, that smell of ink and when he was taking me with him in his office in, in the newspaper. I mean, he was the, um, the essence of traditional, the traditional journalist. And um, it, there was something about him that, I don't know, it was the vision and at the same time, the practical action to make sure that this world, through information, through trust, is becoming a better place. So my dad, as, as you said, yes, I would never have let him, let, let him out of, you know, this dedication in the opening of my book, because he was a father, he was a man that brought his daughter up to never ever have you know any issue any challenge with gender equality any struggle around you know am I weaker am I you know do I belong to the weaker uh, gender there was never such an issue and he would always show me things giving me that that belief that conviction that assurance that I could always achieve in life as long as I operate you know with honesty with dignity with values and hard work I would be able to, to achieve things, but not only for me, for the world. And so that was my dad. And, and I think that he was the one who planted the seeds of feminism in my head, not in the sense that, you know, we think about and we talk about feminism and, and we they always connected and, and quite rightly so, because this is the origin of the word. However, what I argue in the book is that feminism in an ideal world would not exist, should not exist at all. Can I, can I read a passage of course, from the please. book? Please. So, let me find it. By, by perpetuating gender injustice, inequality and bias, humanity not only continues to be guilty of a major ethical blunder, but pays a very expensive price too. I'm often asked if I call myself a feminist, and if Athena 40 is a feminist movement, I will share my definition of feminism. To me, feminism is about dignity. Dignity means being treated as equal, being respected for who you are, being listened to. Dignity is being able to define your own destiny, being free to make your life's choices and free to celebrate them. It is an attitude of self-respect, that finds its way into social, cultural, and religious contexts, but it stretches beyond their limitations. And while we should be able to acknowledge our limitations and we can never eliminate them completely, we can find our way to freedom and independence through them. So 
this is my idea of feminism. I, I don't know if you agree, and I would love, of course, your thoughts. No, I love, I love what you said. You know, I think I would only add maybe a layer of sisterhood, empowerment, but these are things that you always do and speak about anyhow. So very much, you know, your words resonate with me. I think dignity is also the ability to, um, the freedom to tell our own truth. And there is a wonderful quote in your book from a poet and an activist who has always been very important to me and very dear to me, Audre Lorde. And you mentioned how for Audre Lorde, there is no thing as a single issue struggle. You know, you have to be aware of different layers of discrimination, intersectional. I have always been very much, you know, maybe guided or impressed by particularly the 1960s, 70s African American women's movement. I think many of them, of course, being women, they were on the receiving end of, you know, misogyny. Being women of color, they were on the receiving end of racism. Many of them came from LGBTQ plus communities. They knew how homophobia or transphobia worked like, um, worked. But also, I think many of them came from disempowered uh, communities. So they were very much aware of class hierarchy as well. So when they talked about power, they did so in a much more nuanced way than we do today. And when they talked about identity, there was a bigger emphasis on multiplicity that I'm worried that we are losing. So you mentioned how this Greek word aletheia means truth, but when you unpack the words, it means no oblivion. We can't let our truths be forgotten. You know, that really, really struck me. Would you tell us a bit more about, about that? Yes, I, I think, first of all, what you mentioned in the opening, that um, there's a lot of anger around us and it's not good. It's not going to lead us you know, to more progress. It's not going to create better societies. So we need to find a way without forgetting because memory is what creates our identities, right? It is important for us, but we need to add understanding and we need to add tolerance and we need to push aside feelings of resentment, of anger, because uh, uh, if what, the main lesson perhaps from this pandemic over the last year and a half has been our collective vulnerability, right? We are all equally fragile, regardless of, you know, where we live, what we do for a living, if, if we have, you know, access to power or not, if there's, uh, whatever age we are, whatever, you know, ethnicity we come from, we are all equally vulnerable. And so I think, that this is very important to take on board. Alicia, yes, I was thinking about it because the, the, the English translation is truth, but the origin of it for the, the ancient Greeks was, I, I do not forget, I will never forget. I will not forget my identity, but I need to start you know, a new beginning together in a world that changes a lot. To go back to feminism, I think that feminism is essential, Elif, because the system still wants that powerful male, which we were talking about before, vis-a-vis -vis the weaker female. And as long as we're not, you know, staying united and supporting each other, there will be cracks, you know, in our asks, in, in our um, demands or, you know, rights. The populist leader vis-a-vis -a, -vis a polarized society. This is why we need feminism. Or the powerful dictator vis-a-vis -a, -vis a confused nation. So these are phenomena in our societies which are still very prevalent. And in a world which is broken, in societies which are, you know, so troubled, as you have rightly, you know, uh, often said in, in, in your talks and interviews, this is how populists find their way and take advantage of, of people. So we need clarity of thought. We need voices of reason. We need emotional intelligence. And ultimately, I think that this all comes down to education it, and it comes down to books. I mean, I will not refer, refer to academic education because for example, my father never had official academic education, but he was a highly educated 
um, thinker and, and philosopher because he dedicated his life to reading books and writing books. So it was letters and literature that, you know, um, created uh, his, his uh, thought process. So feminism, to get back to that, is about nurturing independent thought, liberating our thinking and allowing our minds to cut those cultural, political, religious borders or tribes, as you called them before. And for that, we need to read, we need education. Um, it is about enriching our understanding of the world and pushing each other, if you like, outside of our comfort zones. Absolutely, and I think this is the right moment to have these conversations. Unfortunately, as we're going through this horrific pandemic, we're also seeing an increase, an alarming increase in domestic violence. When we look at the repercussions of the pandemic, you know, who, is, who are the people who will be losing their jobs? Most of them will be women, youth, immigrants, minorities. So at the beginning, we were told that this was a great equalizer, that the pandemic affected everyone, you know, we were all on the same ship, but that's not the case actually. And we do know that there's, it's so disproportionate the way we're being affected. We were seeing vaccine nationalism, so more and more tribalism. There has to be a different language, a different narrative. So I find what, you, what you're saying so important. But based on that, can I, can I ask you, you know, where do you get your optimism from? But also where do you get, if you have any pessimism from? Because, you know, I think we cannot assume that in the West, we have our rights taken for granted. You know, we cannot assume that democracy is safe and solid anywhere in the world. If anything we have learned in the last years is that countries can go backwards. And even the most basic rights that we have can be taken away. I think when democracy is lost, women and minorities should be more alarmed because the first rights that will be taken away will be women's rights and minority rights. So are you concerned? If so, what is it that makes you maybe more pessimistic slightly, but what gives you hope? What makes you more optimistic? You know, what is the drive between, uh, behind su such, a, such a book? Because you're a connector, you connect people, you empower people, you inspire women. So I also want to understand the optimism. I think that my, the best part of my life has been about networks and connections, but I was always keen, perhaps because I was an only child and, and I was growing up with, uh, my, my parents split, um, split when I was two and a half. I mean, they, they stayed friends for their entire life and I was, you know, seeing them uh, together all the time, but um, being an only child and growing up with, with my mom, it was a lonely uh, ecosystem for me. It was, it was a very small family and I was in need of friends because I did not have siblings. And uh, the, the first network which I created was through this pen pal system where there were those little coupons, if you remember, that uh, school was, would distribute and we would write our names and our address and then we would just post it to, I don't know, to the universe and some new friend from one country or another would arrive in your life and then you would start this correspondence. And because I was keen to meet people from around the world and I was fascinated that was because of my father's stories who had traveled the world and he was talking to me a lot about, you know, New York and India and Africa and, and uh, the Persian Gulf, as it was called at the time, now the Arab Gulf. So all these different geographies and cultures and parts of the world that he had visited, there was something, this drive in me to, to meet those people in different cultures cultures and countries and so my first network consisted of those friends and I think that this stayed with me that there are people out there in this world they may be live they may live in you know a country which is thousands of miles from where you are and believe in a different god or being brought up in a different you know political system but they're humans and they need friends and they need a warm voice through, you know, a letter. And so that stayed with me even, you know, when I started my professional career. 
as a journalist. I was very lucky because I worked, as, as, as you know, with Greek media first, but then CNN International came into my life and I was a contributor for CNN International uh, for about six years. And, and that gave me the opportunity to become part of a community that was called the World Report Contributors. It was a community that Ted Turner had brought together as part of the wider international CNN family. And this is where I had the chance to make new friendships. And so many of, of the women and the, the colleagues that have supported what I, I eventually did in life, which was you know, uh, beyond journalism, Global Thinkers Forum and Athena 40, are friends from that time. And so building those relationships is what has been my main drive and inspiration in life. So basically, ultimately, it is all about people. Mm -hmm. And that is always driving me forward, making me think, you know, in a very optimistic way. On the other hand, talking about pessimism, I think that we are all very confused with what is happening around us. And I think that because there have been problems in our systems that are, you know, inherent problems because of bad policies, because, because of, of lack of, you know, leadership that is able to, to look at things in, you know, um, from, from a perspective of, I don't know, a wider perspective, a global perspective, that this is an interconnected world. It's not something that we decide to do in the United States or in the UK or in Greece, in Turkey, and that will stay without having any repercussions on other countries. There is a spillover effect. And that is creating a lot of challenges for, for humanity as a whole. So this is making me, I would say pessimistic, but I don't think that the world is going to get better soon. I mean, the pandemic has definitely not helped towards this direction. I think we're going to see a period where things perhaps are going to get worse for women, for our economies, for our societies. But the, they are times of profound change and transformation. And this is how, of course, societies change. And we know that. Um, ultimately, I think we're going to create a better world because I think that we are going to learn from the lessons that this pandemic have given us. But it's going to be a, a tough few years. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It, feels, it feels like a crossroads, doesn't it? I mean, when people say, with all the good intentions, when are we going to go back to the normal? There's no going back and that world wasn't very normal anyhow, but we can only build a better world, a fairer world, hopefully. You said several such important things. I want to follow up on that, but I also want to remind our audience to please send us your questions. You can do it via the Q&A uh, function uh, or the chat function. I, I'm keeping an eye on both of them. One thing I want to follow up on is, you know, you of course talked about your work in the media and since then, uh, as we're speaking, actually, the, both the media is changing, but also social media is changing. And there was, a, there was a report recently, I don't know if you had a chance to see, it was quite alarming by UN, carried out across the world, uh, in so many countries, hundreds of people they have spoken with. And everyone, every women journalist, um, women academic, you know, anyone who's a public, who is a, pub, who's a public figure, uh, and happens to be a woman, is saying the same thing, that they're experiencing an escalating abuse on social media. And so I want to talk a little bit about, you know, what do we do on these digital platforms? I think we had too much optimism about digital technologies in late 1990s, early 2000s. There were children named Facebook, there were children named Like, because people thought, you know, thanks to Facebook, we were going to have democracy across the world and the exact opposite happened actually. Do you find it important first of all that women have a presence in the digital sphere and also how do we make our digital platforms much more egalitarian, gender equal? Well, how do you feel about social media? I think it is very worrying and uh, this is why it is very important to uh, have voices like yours, uh, like, like the women in the book, From Women to the World. So um, 
and and men, of course. I mean, as you rightly said before, this is not about women only. It's it's a book that um, communicates to the world the values that we find perhaps more among women. But this is very much a world that needs all genders on board. So um, yes, I think that there is a danger there, especially you know for for people or the younger generations who do not understand the threats that social media, the intrusion in our lives, the fact that we are losing our, our privacy, the fact that, you know, they, they just publish out there anything, you know, in a way that is rather skittish, perhaps I, I would say, or not understanding that this is a public sphere that records and registers everything. And it is not something that perhaps in five or 10 or 20 years time, when they eventually become professionals, they would like to have and see out there. But also there is another thing, which is uh, uh, very dangerous. The fact that these social media that we were hoping and expecting and anticipating that would bring more information, polyphony uh, in our lives, they instead have brought misinformation, disinformation. And so that is creating this gap in trust. And I think that there is another very dangerous monster that is coming our way. And, and, and we need to be able to promote these voices that can bring trust, that can heal the rifts in our societies that are more pacifying voices and they are credible. They promote trust. Now, how we do that, I think that this is the role of journalists, it is the role of thinkers, of philosophers, of people um, who have influence, but they're going to use their influence and their power for, you know, positive change. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I am keeping an eye on the questions, uh, both the chat function and the Q&A. Elizabeth, you know, he, here we are, you know, a Greek journalist and writer, a Turkish writer, Many, some people might not know this, but where we come from, we learn not to like each other, even though there's so much similarity in our, in our cultures. And of course, we have a common history. We have so much to talk about. But the nationalistic, the tribalistic, the jingoistic discourse asks us actually, you know, not to talk to each other. And yet, I think through feminism, through sisterhood, through ideas, we have connected, you know, gone beyond those tribal boundaries. I, I want to dwell a little, little bit about that because I think we have such major challenges ahead of us, whether it's the possibility of another pandemic, cyber terrorism, financial crisis, or our climate, as we're speaking, our, our climate, you know, our, our planet is burning. All of these are international problems, global problems, as you said. We are interconnected and we cannot solve these global problems with the forces of nationalism. How, how do we move forward? I mean, even at a time when we were most expected to unite, we have vaccine nationalism. What do we say as women to this ultra nationalism that keeps coming and coming? Uh, what, what do you think, what kind of narrative could be the answer to that? Uh, well, when you and I were kids, the world was still battling with deep ideological rifts that had a political nature. Mm -hmm. uh, primarily had to do with the eternal fight between communism and capitalism. We had the East and West, the Iron Can Curtain, the Berlin Wall. A extreme things were happening in the name of one political ideology or another. And then, of course, uh, as of 1989, things changed and a new era in global governance began with the ideas of unity and collaboration prevailing, or we thought so, we hoped so. But this was not the case as, as things turned out, uh, unfortunately. Fast forward to today, uh, 32 years later, Perhaps we managed to heal some of those rifts and achieved some progress against poverty or in favor of gender equality. But meanwhile, new rifts have been created. And to get to your point about women, I think that ultimately the main victims, the main um, or, or uh, the groups of society who are being impacted in a negative way the most are 
the, the marginalized ones or the ones to, towards which the system is not friendly. And this is where women belong, unfortunately. This is where LGBTQ um, uh, people belong or, or, or people who are somehow pushed towards you know, the, the, the outskirts of our societies. And this is where we need to have a role and we need to have an intervention. Now, how do we achieve that? I will always remember the words of another brilliant uh, author like, like yourself, Elif, and, and activist and feminist, Nawal El Sadawi, who was recently, um, she recently passed away at the age of 89 and leaving behind a great legacy uh, in, this, in the space of feminism. So Nawal had told me, Elizabeth, we need to organize ourselves. There is a lot of fragmentation fragmentation of knowledge and that pulls us apart because we do not understand the world and things you know from the same perspective or not not really the same perspective that is not the right word but from you know understanding each other and embracing each other's diversity and we need to organize ourselves as women mm -hmm. so i think that this is a message that comes uh, through the book, I would like to hope, but also from your work and my, my work. It is not about, you know, each of us raising a flag about our own issues. It is about raising a flag for each other's issues. Mm -hmm. And this is how we're going to achieve change for everyone. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And I think when we are divided in this way, the only thing that benefits from those divisions is patriarchy itself. We have um, brilliant questions, actually, one after another. I'll read the first one quickly, try to summarize it a little bit. Um, Alice Marmara, she says, I'm interested to know what role do you, you believe the individual plays in creating a fairer, more tolerant society versus a top-down approach of governments, etc., implementing policy to create change. So the role of individuals which I think is an important question because sometimes we feel like, what can I do as an individual, you know, when so much is happening, what can I change possibly? Um, we feel a little bit helpless. So I'm curious to hear your answer. Well, this is where I think the role uh, of role models is very important because uh, to me, for example, my mentors in my life or people that I've admired some of them I was lucky enough to meet I was you know uh, lucky because they took me under their wings and supported me and guided me and you know showed me how to approach life with with a purpose and a mission of course including my my parents uh, but but I think it is also very important to to understand that we can emulate stories of people who are good leaders. And, and when I say leaders, you know, sometimes we have this stereotype that the leader is always someone who is in the government, you know, who leads a state. That's not true. Each of us is a leader, a potential leader, because all of us need to take, you know, a decision for ourselves, our loved ones, our families or community or our nation when we vote, when we you know, are in a, in a country that is democratic and we enjoy this privilege of, of voting. So in, in that sense, I think that it is very important to uh, emulate people who operate under value systems. And there are many of them out there. Sometimes I get this question, how can we find you know, role models? One of the reasons why you know, this, this book, From Women to the World, was, was created is because it is a, a pool for role models. It is, a, it is a source of stories, which are stories of survival and inspiration. And we learn that it is through adversity that we can still serve others. We learn that it is through challenges that we can still thrive, but also thrive bringing others on board to thrive as well. Absolutely. I, I also believe that real change will come from civil society, you know, ground up, not top down. But we can put pressure on our, and we must put pressure on our politicians, on the, you know, political elite. But in fact, I think, you know, the dynamism, the energy for change is actually coming from the periphery, not necessarily the center, also from, from youth, from minorities, from women. So we have to be in the public space. And the next question, the next question actually 
made me sigh as I was reading because, you know, I so share the heart behind this question. Do you believe there will ever be a society where racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, and all kinds of discrimination will stop, cease to exist? Is that possible? I don't think in our lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> It is, it is an excellent question and I wish uh, I could say that yes, we will reach, you know, at some point, you know, that higher level of thinking, higher level of existing, of, of, of being, you know, but uh, I think it's going to take time, but it is because we are fighting and we are joining forces and voices to make sure that we, you know, we eliminate such phenomena as much as we can. We cannot, there are no magic wands. Nothing can change overnight. And if it does change overnight, it will not necessarily be for good because we need some time to adapt to change and change happens gradually. You know, it's cultural change. It's, it's relearning our world or how to operate in a world that is again, so confused and so broken what do you think? Are you more optimistic than I am? You know, optimism doesn't come easily to me. I think sometimes jokingly, if you open a map of Europe and if you look at the river Danube, the blue Danube, you trace it with your finger um, towards the east. I think as you go towards the Black Sea, the level of optimism drops. So by the time you reach Balkans, Black Sea, Anatolia, we're not very optimistic people. Uh, maybe because history is still so, you know, the wounds are so raw, uh, open. But at the same time, I think we, we need hope. We need, we need a healthy dose of optimism. I don't mind if the mind is a pessimist, but the heart has to remain an optimist. So I like what Gramsci used to talk about, you know, the pessimism of the intellect will make us more alert about what is at stake. But in our hearts, I think we have to believe that one day it is possible uh, to see racism, sexism, all kinds of discrimination evaporating, you know. And the next question actually is quite close to my heart because it focuses on language. Uh, you know, um, Argiri, thanks us, thanks you for being so open and eloquent this evening, and then says, I can't help but admire your use of language as I'm listening to you and wonder what are your views on the importance of language in today's world? in the struggle for equality and equity for all. I think it's so important because not only what kind of language we use, narrative, rhetoric, but also how we talk about the other. I think the darkest chapters in human history have started with that, you know, when we started to other nice communities through language, through seemingly innocent jokes, words. I'd love to have your thoughts on, on language. My view has always been that it comes down to respect. Mm -hmm. When we operate, you know, in a respectful manner towards others, and that means respect towards their culture, age, their, their work in life, what they are as human beings, what they are as beings, really, then there can not be any, any issues. When I uh, moved to, to live in Qatar, so after CNN, I worked with Al Jazeera English for three years. Um, and I lived in Qatar, in the Arab Gulf. And I remember that back then in Greece, I was still based in Greece at the time. And it, it, it became, you know, a, a huge conversation in the Greek media that, you know, Elizabeth Filippouli is joining Al Jazeera English and she's moving to, uh, to Doha. And the question was, Elizabeth, how are you going to survive, you know, in a, in a very conservative Muslim society? It's going to be hostile, it's going to be this and that, you know, all the stereotyping and, and all the cliches around it. But uh, me being me or, you know, someone who was very accustomed to, to uh, communicate with people from different cultures, I never had, you know, any second thoughts. On the contrary, it was something which I embraced, you know, with openness of heart openness of mind and respect. So I moved to a country which I knew was very different to the country that I grew up in. 
and the countries that perhaps, you know, I worked in like the US or the UK, but I went and operated with a spirit of adaptation. That also includes language. I think it is very important to be respectful towards people's sentiments, uh, religion, cultures, values. When, uh, when we introduced ELIF, and you have been an incredible supporter of our work at Global Thinkers Forum and the programs, when we introduced the mentoring programs six years ago, which support women and youth around the world with an eight month um, mentoring journey, mm -hmm. number one, value or, or, or guidance was to never disrespect or try to change the perceptions, beliefs and values of the person that would be mentored. Mm -hmm. I think once again that it all comes down to how we allow the other person to be who they want to be um, by respecting this without trying to change it. Absolutely. Elizabeth, I would love to end this, you know, conversation. I can talk to you for hours, but I would love to end uh, with the way you ended the, the book. In other words, in an open-ended way. Uh, and it's, it's, it's really struck me to see how you finish the book by addressing the daughters of the world. But I'd love you to tell us a, a, a few a few words about that, you know, that sense of continuity, but also maybe our responsibility to the next generation. You know, what are the things that we should be doing better in order to honor their anxieties, you know, the uncertainties that they're dealing with, the inequalities that they're dealing with. So why did you, why did you first of all finish the book in that way? Um, you left it, I think, very open-ended, fluid, uh, which I love. I love you tell us a bit more about that, the daughters of the world. Um, so uh, when my publisher asked me to write a letter, it was a challenge for me because all of you uh, have shared your stories, your personal, you know, letters in the form of an essay and, and you're sharing something from your own ideas, your own hearts, your lives. And I didn't want to write a letter because in a way, I have been the connector, I have been the editor, I have been, you know, the person who has brought together this incredible, you know, uh, group of women and the narratives that you have shared. I, I wanted to take a step, you know, aside, but at the same time, I was keen to communicate a message that this book and these messages should rise above cultures, ethnicities, race, age, this is about us as human beings, which comes up to the conversation once again. It is about our humanness. It is about opening a door to each other and, and escaping if we need to. I mean, I remember uh, something that Geraldine Sharp Newton writes in her letter, a paragraph from her letter, that she needed a door and it was Molly Yard that, you know, uh, opened this door to her. And so I thought that by writing a letter that would encourage all daughters of the world to, to embrace each other's differences, to embrace each other's narratives and stories, this way we would be able to open, you know, a door to, to each other's hearts. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it answers your question. That, that's beautiful. And I think a letter is also so personal. It's a way of saying, I see you, you know, I recognize your existence, I respect you. Um, so that, that connection is, is beautiful. I, you know, um, can I, can I ask something if, yes. if that is okay? Because I mean, this launch, which is so important uh, this evening and, and thank you for, for being uh, here and for being together in this conversation, but it is also another 32 women. And I would like to, to take a minute and to mention their names because they have been, you know, contributors in this book. Jun Sarpong, Rulazar Douglas, Helen Lumkuse, Basma Lawi, Annabel Carmel, Muna Busuleiman, Yasmin Al Masri, Anusha Ansari, Imana Un, Emma Beish, Sylvia Kesa, Shomina Abji, Basma Al Said, Mary Davis, Dima Bibi, Paula Diana, Her Royal Highness Princess Sumaya of Jordan, Grazia Giuliani. Miriam Gonzalez Durantes, 
Elif Shafak, Eva Kaili, Livia Firth, Atiyah Mahmoud, Martina Melbourne, Christina Nielsen, Femi Oke, Gail Jemak Lemon, Marianne Pearl, Shamim Sharif, Geraldine Sharp Newton, Rebecca Tomley, Nur Denise Tuncher, Dame Stephanie Shirley, and Elizabeth Filippouli. And a huge, huge thank you to each and all. Here's a, to a wonderful book or work or legacy that we have created together. Elizabeth, you know, I felt so emotional as I was listening to you read out, you know, aloud the, the names of every contributor, uh, honoring them, respecting them. As we're speaking right now in Istanbul, in a public square, women are demonstrating and they're reading out the names of women who have been murdered, you know, they have been the victims of uh, gender violence and femicides. We have to change this world. And I think it will be through works like yours, through voices like yours. I want to thank you. I think we're living in a world in which we have too much information, less knowledge, even less wisdom. But I want to thank you particularly for bringing wisdom to our public spaces. It really matters to me. I'm so happy and honored that you are my Greek sister. I want to thank everyone for listening to our conversation and for joining us. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you very much, Elif. There's a lot more to do, and we will do things together in the years ahead. Absolutely, absolutely.